Hello, and welcome to Speaking of Psychology, a podcast produced by the American Psychological Association. I'm your host, Caitlin Luna. I'm joined today by Dr. Marianne Chilano, co-author of Something Happened in Our Town, a children's book about racial injustice from Imagination Press, which is APA's children's books imprint. The story, written with fellow psychologists and colleagues, Dr. Marietta Collins and Dr. Ann Hazard, follows a white family and a black family as they discuss the police shooting of a black man in their town. The purpose of the book is to spark important discussions within families about racial injustice. Dr. Chilano is the director of Emory University's Parent-Child Interaction Therapy Program, as well as a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Chilano. Thanks for inviting me. So first I wanted to talk about what sparked your interest in this topic, you and your co-authors. I would say a couple of years ago, my co-authors and I became increasingly concerned about the disproportionate police shootings of unarmed African-American individuals, particularly boys and men. Um, and we wondered how kids reacted to that. If kids heard about it, how they would react, what questions they would have. So we decided to write a book that would sort of be a platform for parents to discuss this, these events with their children and begin to discuss patterns of racial bias and injustice in our country. So on the topic of that, I'm, I'm sure it's very tough for many parents to try to imagine telling their children about these complex issues like race issues in America today. Mm -hmm. And many parents themselves may still be dealing with their own feelings about it and understanding how, what's going on within themselves. Mm -hmm. So, but why is it still important for parents to talk to their children? Well, I agree. It's a very complicated issue and it's mm -hmm. a, a very sensitive issue as well. Um, I think it's important for parents to talk about this issue because they're primarily responsible for socializing their children and raising them to, be, to live in the world. Um, and kids observe the world, their social world. They observe uh, who's included, who's excluded. They observe where people live. They observe racial disparities. Um, they observe lots of things. They are um, consumers of media. They see how African Americans and whites are portrayed in the media. They observe things about their parents, who their parents' friends are, who their parents' close friends are, um, what their parents say, what their parents don't say verbally, but maybe say with their bodies. Um, so they're picking up on a lot of messages about race and about and racial attitudes. Um, who parents may inadvertently send out messages about who should be their friend and who should not be their friend. So they pick up on these things. And if we say nothing, then what's influencing our children's racial attitudes are messages they get from the media, from their friends. Um, but if you say things directly to the children about what you want them to learn, then it's more likely to take. And particularly children under the age of seven are very amenable to external instruction, to listening to their parents' words. As they get older, then experience weighs in more on what they learn. But earlier, they really do listen to what we say. Yeah. So what do we know about how kids learn about racism? Okay, well, there's a field within psychology called ethnic racial socialization which has to do with the verbal and nonverbal messages that parents tell their kids about the meaning and significance of race, racial identity, and how they should interact with people from another race. And what we know is that African-American parents give these messages at a pretty early age. You know, they talk about um, what it means to be black in the United States, messages of cultural pride, um, messages, sometimes messages of mistrust, how you should act around white people, um, how to cope with racism, how to cope with racial injustice. Um, we know less about what white parents do with white children in this area, um, but what we do know is that many white parents think race is not as relevant. Um, so they don't talk about this. They don't have these conversations with their kids. Um, and so that leaves the kids open to learning about race from other sources. And what's the biggest takeaway of this book for children and for parents? Well, what we really want, number one, is we want parents and kids to talk about this. We want parents and kids to have discussions about what is racial bias, what is racial injustice, um, how important it is to treat everyone fairly. Um, for the kids, there's basically two messages. One is we want to give them some actions they can take to counter acts of racial injustice, which for young children, often that's exclusion of peers. Um, the other message we want to impart is uh, diversity is something to be celebrated, not just tolerated, right? So there's uh, value in diversity. 
uh, the character, the older sister character of the, of the white girl in the book says, you never know who's going to be your best friend. And that's a really important message. So that you don't just include people because it's the right thing to do, but because there's value in including everybody. And one of the unique things about Imagination Press books is that they include information for parents, notes, sample questions they can ask their children, which is a wonderful part of these books. So can you explain the tips in the book and how they help parents and have these conversations and how they, um, how they might spurn these, these dialogues? Well, sure. And we feel like that's a very important part of the book. Um, so one of the things we learned in doing some research is that, uh, especially for white parents, uh, I think 80% of white parents of four to seven-year-old kids want to talk about race with their children, but they don't really know how. They don't know how to break it down into concepts that their young children can understand, and they're not even sure when is the right time to begin the conversation. Um, and what usually happens is the conversation begins when the child brings it to our attention, when the child asks a question, often a potentially embarrassing question. Um, and so the kid might say, how come Jada's skin is dirty? You know, or how come all the people in this neighborhood are black? You know, or something like that. And so it comes up when the child asks a question for many parents. And so we wanted to have sample questions and answers as part of the resources at the end of the book. And also sample definitions and ways to, um, answer, ways to answer the child's question in language that the kid can understand and ways to translate concepts of inclusion into actions that children can take. And for African American families or families of color, what advice do you have to them for them about how to talk to their children? Well, African American families typically have these conversations earlier, and in particular related to these police shootings of unarmed African American um, individuals. Many black parents talk about the conversation that they have to have with their children about, especially their boys, about how to act in public um, and how to not be a target. What actions they can take, how they can wear different clothes, how they can act, you know, when stopped by a police officer to try to protect them. Um, in terms of messages of cultural pride and history, I mean, that's there's an illustrated conversation in the book with the African American boy and his parents, and his parents do mention that they're um, very proud of their cultural history, and they mention um, powerful leaders, civil rights leaders, and talk about the value of collective action. Um, in addressing social justice. So that's all part of the book and it's an example in the book with that family as well. And what's interesting is that this, the release date of this book was moved up mm -hmm. due to this, the shooting of Stefan Clark, who is an unarmed black man and who was in his grandmother's backyard. He was shot by police. Mm -hmm. Can you describe and explain why the, the book was moved up and the significance of that? Yeah, my understanding is the book was moved up because of that incident, because APA, Imagination Press, and the authors wanted the family to have the book as a resource and wanted to be responsive to the communities that this um, tragic shooting affected. And this is the first picture book you and your co-authors have written. Yes. So, um, and you've received positive reviews and, and press coverage most recently, or very recently, in the um, Atlanta Journal Constitution, which is where Emory is located. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about um, what that's been like for you and your co-authors? Um, we've been delighted with the positive response to the book, um, especially from children. We've read the book to groups of children as well, and groups of parents and children, um, and we've been very pleased with the responses that we've gotten. Um, kids readily understand that it's not fair to exclude other people, so they get that message. Um, some kids have studied you know, racism in school with an anti-bias curriculum or in social studies when they learn about slavery and Jim Crow laws and segregation and all that, and so they have a context to put it in. Other kids have not yet studied that because they're younger, but they still understand that it's important to treat everyone the same and to be fair to everyone. Um, so we've gotten pretty res positive response to the book. And the book has not been without some controversy. I mean, there was a, an op-ed in the, in the Hill that was published that basically said the book was anti-police. And mm -hmm. you and your co-authors had a rebuttal op-ed that said that the author misunderstood the book. Can you explain why he might have perceived the book to be seen as, as biased against police and how you responded to that? Can you elaborate more on your response to him? So. It, the, we don't conceptualize the book as being anti-police. It does start with a police shooting of an unarmed African-American uh, male. So we were very direct in starting the book that way. Something happened in our town. You know, the kids, the grown-ups didn't think the kids knew about it, but the kids knew about it and they had questions. Um, and the parents are very direct in how they explain this event. 
um, that, the, that the man was unarmed and that it was a mistake that the police officer shot the man. And both, uh, both the white family and the black family put that act into sort of political or racial context, you know, the pattern of racial disparities and racial injustice in our country. Um, we take great pains to point out that it was a mistake and that many cops, both black and white, make the right choice. Um, but as one of the characters, I believe that Josh's father, the African-American father in the story says, we can't always count on them to make the right choice, which is a hard message, but we felt it was a realistic message. Um, and so we included that in there. Um, we recognize that children do tend to think of police officers as um, trusted gatekeepers. And they're often security guards at their schools and things like that. And we do want children to trust police officers, um, but we hope that children, as they develop, they you know, develop more nuanced ways of understanding uh, their world. Things are not just good or bad, right? Um, and police officers are good, but sometimes they make mistakes. Um, we also adopt this attitude when we're teaching children about sex abuse prevention and about uh, personal body safety. You know, it does create some discomfort in children. They may not trust some adults after they learn that adults could hurt them. But we feel like the outcome of personal safety for the child is worth that discomfort um, that we have to embrace when we talk about that with them. With them. So we also feel that the outcome of social justice is worth the temporary discomfort we feel when we have to talk about how some police officers make the wrong choice. And is there any worry or for parents or caregivers that their children might read this book and be scared of the police? Especially young children, maybe in the four or five, eight year, eight year old age range? You know, that scared of the police, I, that has not come up as much uh, other than fear that they may already have based on hearing about the police shootings of unarmed African-American individuals. Um, I've had some kids be surprised that the police officer killed someone who they, didn't, they shouldn't have killed. Um, and they surprised at that mistake. Um, but I haven't had reactions of people that were scared. And so going off of the reaction, yeah. you're saying, what has the reaction been from, you know, from readers and from children, from families, caregivers? What have they told you and what have you and your co-authors? Um, so it, it sort of depends on who you ask, right? So parents, um, many parents have called the book bold or ambitious. And uh, particularly African-American parents have uh, told me that they're grateful that this book is now um, available for them. Um, we've also heard from white parents who've told us that this book is very important to them as well, that they have been meaning to try to have a conversation about race with their children, but they didn't know exactly how to address it. Um, and so they have found particularly the uh, tips in the back very helpful as well. So what age range is this book targeted for? So it's targeted for kids four to eight, but we really feel like parents should make the decision about when they think their child is ready for this book. Uh, and parents should read it first and uh, look at the tips in the back. We feel like parents know their kids best and may some parents may choose to read this book to their child when they're four. Other parents may say, mm, my child's not ready yet, seven. And some kids that are older than eight may get something out of the book as well. We feel that kids younger than four probably wouldn't understand a lot of the book. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Cholano. Thanks for having me. For more information about something happened in our town and to order the book, please visit APA's website. Speaking of Psychology is part of the APA Podcast Network, which includes other great podcasts such as the APA Journal's Dialogue about the latest and most exciting psychological research and Progress Notes, which discusses the practice of psychology. You can find all of our APA podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also go to our website at speakingofpsychology.org and listen to more episodes and see more resources about the topics we discuss. I'm Caitlin Luna with the American Psychological Association.